My name is Alan Burt, and welcome to The Commerce Lab, the show for growth-minded e-commerce entrepreneurs who want to scale their business. After having worked with dozens of successful brands through my firm, Blue Stout, I've been fortunate enough to see what it takes to successfully scale a physical products business into the eight figures and beyond. On this show, we'll dive deep into the e-commerce economy to analyze the cutting edge strategies of today's top performing brands and the industry leaders who are engineering their growth. If you want actionable advice and tactics you can implement into your business today, then keep listening. If you want to join a mastermind of other entrepreneurs and leading brand owners, then join us in the Commerce Lab official community on Facebook or visit thecommercelab.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Commerce Lab. And today I'm joined by the VP of Growth at Molecule, Gaurav Agrawal. And we discuss today how to predictably model growth for your brand. And to give you some some reference as to as to why Garov is the guy to to talk about this, Molecule is a brand that's based out of San Francisco. They manufacture a a new age type of air purifier, and they've you've probably seen them around. They're doing incredibly well. Uh, but most importantly, since day one of launch, Molecule has achieved seven figures in revenue every single month literally since the first month they launched. And what we did on the show today was break down Garov's exact framework and his exact model for how he achieved that. So some of the things we discussed today, his framework for success and how to predictably model revenue growth for a digitally native brand, why Molecule hasn't seen their ad costs or customer acquisitions costs go up. We've seen, we talked to brands all day long that are seeing massive increase in their customer acquisition costs. It's one of the biggest issues that brands are facing in 2019. But what has Molecule done to help mitigate that and actually keep those costs consistent? Uh, how to build a growth team. At this stage, Molecule has gone out and raised a fair amount of venture capital and built a large team. But we, we talk about how Garov structured his team in the very early days and how other brands that are earlier in their journey or you may be doing lower in seven figures of revenue, trying to decide who they should hire internally, who the, what types of tasks they should outsource to agencies. We break that down very specifically by task. And then finally, we talk about the power of retention referrals and how you can actually manufacture referrals in your business and how to do that. This was a, a very, very in-depth conversation. And the, the framework that Garf brings is something that any brand owner or marketer uh, can take and apply specifically in their business. He approaches it much like a hedge fund manager would approach it. He models out the various different acquisition channels for the brand, understands the risks, the probabilities of each, and that way can predictably determine whether or not it's going to be successful or not. Or by understanding the risks and the risk profiles, he can model out enough channels to, to ensure that it's going to be successful. So it's a different type of framework than I'm sure you've probably heard before. And it's something that every brand should be considering and thinking about as they're looking to scale in 2019. So please enjoy this very in-depth conversation with Garov as we break down his framework and model for predictably scaling a brand. Hey, Garov, welcome to the show. Glad to have you. Thanks, Alan. Thank you for having me. And you're, you guys are down in San Francisco, right? Yes, we are. We are in the Soma region of San Francisco. Okay. Well, very cool. And we'll, we'll kind of get to sort of the location of you guys and, and how that might be interesting here in a little bit. But to give everybody a little bit of context, would you mind just giving us just sort of a quick, you know, 30 second intro to who you are and a little bit of an intro to Molecule? Yeah, sounds great. So hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Gaurav. I run growth at Molecule. So at Molecule, we are commercializing disruptive air purification science. So unlike like your indoor air can be five times more dirty or polluted than the air outside. And there's bad stuff in your air, mold, allergens, VOCs, bacteria, that's constantly making you sick, but you don't know about it. And, and, and that is the problem Molecule is here to solve. So unlike other air filters that trap pollutants, Molecule completely destroys pollutants and breaks them down into carbon dioxide and water. So we are commercializing this fundamental technology. Please go to molecule, www.molecule.com to see how beautiful our product is. It's, it's powered with this technology that I've been telling you about. And, and with regards to distribution, we believe hardware is going through a, an interesting phase where people, like a lot of other commerce, people are skipping retail and they are skipping the distributor and going to consumer directly. 
So with Molecule, we have done exactly that. We have built a digitally native brand that talks to our target market in a very sophisticated way, the way they would love to be spoken to. And, and you've scaled a seven figure per month business uh, directly going to consumers. We've never had a month actually that was less than seven figures and we are growing really fast. We are growing triple digits year on year. So that's a little bit about Molecule. So yes, I run growth there. Growth in Molecule is seen as an, is an overarching thing that, that, that goes across the entire customer life cycle. So I'm responsible for acquisition. I'm responsible for retention. I'm also responsible for a part of the growth product. I also look at or contribute to some of the brands stuff that the team is working on. And I also look at sales, sales and, and business development. So yes, growth is the revenue pillar at Molecule. Prior to Molecule, I was a product manager at an, at an artificial intelligence company that came out of MIT Media Lab. And before that, I was in banking. That is where I, I learned the intricacies of number and, and the art of evaluating risk and making decisions uh, on the fly. So there's there's a ton in that that I want to <laughs> I want to dive into and, and sort of deconstruct. So let's let's sort of start at the very beginning of that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that you guys have been doing you know seven figures in revenue per month uh, ever since the beginning. So is that literally from you know the first first month that you launched? You guys were immediately up in the seven figure mark. Yes. Wow. And what was what did that build up to launch look like? How did, how were you guys able to achieve that so so quickly? That's a really interesting question. Uh, so there are some, the way in which you can actually model that out, Alan, that's a, that's a, that's something that I've been trying to talk to a lot of people about where, so let's talk about, there are, let's talk about growth channels, right? Uh, so yeah. you look at email list, for example, and you can, if you have an email list of thousand people, you could say that, you could say that what are the range of probabilities that this email list would convert and what would those conversion rate looks like? So what I do and what's a regular practice at Molecule is we map three scenarios for every channel and we call it the most optimistic scenario, the realistic scenario, and the pessimistic scenario. And the difference between the optimistic and the pessimistic gives us the spread. So in the finance industry, we use this word called spread, which means the difference between the max and the min, which is where a potential outcome would lie. So now when we model growth or when we look at a channel mix, we like to model us, we like to model all the three outcomes for all the three channels for, for all the channels we have. Now there are some channels or there are some efforts you do as you launch, such as press, that you don't know where the outcome would be. So you could say on a good day, we might get zero sales out of press. Or sorry, on a bad day, we would get zero sales out of a press. On a good day, if press is ready is really benevolent to us, then we could get 1,000 units sold via press. So now your range is zero to 1,000. Similarly, when in, in, imagine an Excel sheet, right, that has press as one line. Now go below and write another one. Let's call it uh, Facebook. And you know that on a good day, Facebook can give you 10. Uh, on a bad day, Facebook can give you 10. On a good day, Facebook can give you 35, 35 units per day. So when you, when you start modeling scenarios for all of your channels, so you, you, what you would see is you have listed down the potential probabilities of all the channels and where would they rank and, and how much sales can they contribute. And based on that, what we do is we choose, we choose two buckets. <clears throat> we call one bucket as bread and butter. And the goal of bread and butter is to ensure that we hit a certain amount of revenue at the minimum. <clears throat> so if I'm looking for my bread and butter, I'm going to go for channels that are more stable, that are more predictable, and the spread is low. What, what does that mean, right? If the spread is low, that means your degree of confidence on the channel is high. So that means it makes sense for you to put more resources there because worst case, you will get 10. Best case, you'll get 25. But at the worst case, you will at least get 10. So we have a bread and butter channel portfolio, which, is, which are channels that are going to deliver revenue no matter what. And then we have a moonshot channel distribution, which is stuff like PR, stuff like a viral video campaign that we want to launch, where we know that the confidence interval or the spread is extremely high and the confidence interval is low. And, and we know that we can't build a stable business based 
based on based on channels that that are that are highly unpredictable so we use them as an opportunity for for a high upside but we hedge our risk constantly by having a channel mix that is more predictable and and by some and 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 ensuring that we have planned according to them so leading up to a launch what we did was we looked at all our channels we looked at the level of predictability and we intentionally chose a channel mix that allowed us a certain roi and a certain predictable revenue and anything beyond that if one of our moonshots landed successfully then there's a chance that we have an upside does that answer the question alan no that's a fantastic answer yeah i would have loved i would have generally loved a, a, a spreadsheet to show this <laughs> it's very difficult one to communicate uh, on, it on is this audio it is, and it's, and and I agree. Now, I also have a a banking and finance background, so I'm I'm very much in the same same realm as you. I used to live in Excel, you know, over a decade ago. But the so I for to me, it makes absolute total sense thinking about it in terms of modeling out, you know, a successful launch and the probabilities associated with sort of a low end and a high end range. What I'm curious by is, and I think that's much easier to do once you have some data to understand how well the product performs within certain channels um, and what your customer acquisition costs look like and things like that. What I'm curious about is leading up to a launch, how did you go about determining what those sort of low and high ranges would be per channel when you hadn't launched the product to market yet? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question, Alan. And, and, and truth being said, right, there's no hard and fast way of knowing it and there's no accurate way of knowing right. this. So what I found really helpful is, is talking to peers, talking to peers who sell at a similar product at a similar price range. So, so that way you would understand what are the channels that have worked for you and that will allow you to create your own thesis. That's one. The second way is there are also some channels that you can try out. So for example, Facebook is, you, before we launched, we tried to use Facebook as a way to generate leads. And and you can you can use that learning with to that to generate an upper funnel metric. You can use that cost to figure out what it would mean. What would that cost look like if that lead list converts at one percent? And now you have some sort of an early indicator of what would Facebook do to you. Now that that is not possible with Google, for example. If you if you're trying to use lead generation as a proxy to estimate final conversion using Google Search that may not be the best way because people don't sign up on google search so there are there are for, so i think if you break it down into a three step process right talk to your peers understand which channels worked for them and which did not but when you understand which channels worked don't focus on yeah pinterest didn't work for that person so it's not going to work for me that is the wrong attitude ask or try to dig into why did pinterest not work for them you may find mm. that they their product was not suited for a platform like Pinterest. Or you may learn the deeper intricacies of how Pinterest as a platform works. For example, talking about Pinterest, Pinterest, if you are really running Pinterest, your attribution window should be 60 to 90 days. That is what is recommended if you want to spend money on Pinterest. So talk to peers and try and understand which channels work for them and which do not, but go into the detail of why did something work for them and why did something not work for them and bring all of that information back and see which of the whys work in your favor and which of the whys do not. And based on that, make a decision on which should be the channels that are in your mix. You can take this a step further if you, if you, if you, if you can find an upper funnel metric or if you can find a proxy that will help you estimate what conversion would look like. But I, I think that is pretty much the extent to which you can go, specifically if you're not selling the product. And is that how you guys continue to run, you know, growth internally even today? So, you know, let's go past launch. Let's, let's look at where you are now. Um, do you guys on a monthly basis assess those channels and look at how they're performing and sort of adjust where you place, where you invest more dollars or where you hire more team? Or how does that, how does the way that you model that out now versus when you first launched, how has that changed? I think we've only, so the philosophy and the fundamental nature is still the same. We are still very okay. first principle driven, but as you start mm. growing, there are other factors you need to start to bring into the mix. So you have to look at audience sizes, you have to look at frequency, you have to look at saturation, you have to be watching out for audience overlaps between different channels. So what we have done is we have 
created our we have created a I wouldn't say a tool, but a philosophy or a process around us trying to estimate this as much as possible. And what we, we what we still do is before we launch a channel, we try and see why would the channel work for us and why would that not work for us. Based on that why, come up with a test. And oftentimes a test does not have to be trying to sell units. The test can be trying to get people on our website and see what is the quality of that traffic. Because those tests, if, if we were to run tests only basis on only based on sales, those tests would be extremely expensive. So yes, the philosophy of a new channel experimentation is still the same. Why do we think this is going to work for us? What is the cheapest test that we can design that will give us some sort of an indicator that yes, this is a good idea or this is a bad idea? But as you start scaling channels, right, the law of diminishing return kicks in. Audience saturation mm -hmm. is real. Your frequency would increase, and you'd realize that every every dollar that you spent does not mean that you'll be get you'll be getting the same you'll be getting the customer at the same ROAS, and that is where the mix gets interesting because now you are not just modeling the probabilities of purchase for each channel, you are modeling the probabilities of purchase for each channel given a certain amount of spending. So you may decide that. It's better for me to not spend this extra ten thousand dollars on Facebook because the 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 added CAC is going to be high. And let me take that money and put it somewhere else. Let me let me spend it on a brand awareness campaign. At least I know that I'm reaching a lot of people. But you'll have to get really smart because your channels saturate quickly. I think that's and for you guys. Did you find that that happened more quickly over the last year? And the more brands we talked to, 2018 seemed to be a bit of a reckoning, especially in the paid acquisition space in terms of cost of acquisition going absolutely to the roof. And that seems to be a continuing trend in 2019. Was that something you guys had to constantly adjust because you found that going up so high? Or I'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of that change in the market and the rising customer acquisition costs and how you guys are adjusting to it. Actually, no. So we we no, did really? pretty well with regards to, of course, the, the, it, it is a fact that the cost of acquisition, the CPMs are rising, but we did not face the brunt of it. And, and here is how I think you can diversify CAC or CPA risk. And, and I think the first piece is truly, under, truly finding new audiences. Here is how the CAC will go high, right? If you are only going after the same people again and again, and if you are, if you're going after the same people with the same message in the same channel, that is where your CAC is, is a sure thing. There's a, there's a sure predictable outcome that the CAC will go high. So let's break it down, right? So same, same audience, same message in the same channel. Now, if you break this down into, into, in, and analyze each one of them, let's look at audience. If you are a company that's, want, that's trying to scale, you need to ensure that the total audience pool you can reach also scales. So for example, let's talk about Molecule. If I'm only going to sell Molecule to people in San Francisco for wildfires, then that market is not going to scale. I cannot scale that 200% uh, year on year. But the moment I start trying, I, I start to see that, that this product can solve the need for an allergy sufferer in Texas. Then I know that I have added a truly incremental audience whom I can sell. And now I can find future growth from that audience. So, so in the, if you look at all the offline businesses, right, this is a great way how they scale. You have a restaurant in San Francisco, awesome. You want to increase your growth by 5X, open five restaurants in five other cities. So, mm -hmm. What, I, what I'm talking about here is finding truly new audience that you are not talking to. So that's the first lever that you need to be pulling and playing with and staying ahead of before your CAC starts to rise. The second one is message. The interesting piece about message is you can't reinvent your message every month, every six months, because your brand is, is something that's more like a North Star. But what you can do is you can, you can create fresh creatives, you can create fresh content, and especially as you get into new audiences, if you have a restaurant in San Francisco and now you're opening a restaurant in Los Angeles, there is some room for you now to create some custom messaging that is relevant to that new audience. You're still following the same, the central brand playbook 
and you're still st sticking to the brand guidelines, but now you are talking to a truly incremental audience. But yes, agreed that message does not have a huge part. But when you're talking to the same audience, when you're talking to people in San Francisco, it's important that you do not end up creating message fatigue. It's important you show them different kinds of creative. It's important you build trust. It's important you come across as a dynamic brand. And the number of times I've seen digitally native brands take this lightly, uh, it just shocks me. Like, yes, you are going after the same audience. That's all right. But you need to watch out for frequency and you need to ensure that your frequency is around two or three. That means create more creative, create more content. And now the third piece was channels. So reaching the same audience with the same message in the same channel. And, and, and I think that is an interesting part. Even if you are not inventing new audiences or not trying to find new audiences, and even if you're not creating new messaging, it's at least important for you to find new channels. Because at some point, let's go back to a restaurant example. If you are a restaurant who is trying to deliver food and make money off that, and if you're only going to do that via Uber Eats, at some point you saturate Uber Eats. And now if you need to find new audiences, you will have to deliver food via DoorDash and Postmates. And that is how you, you, find, you find people who fit your same audience persona, people who, who, who live in San Francisco and want to order food, that's your persona. But they all spend time on different channels. And you need to diversify your channels to reach the same audience. So again, I'll, I'll quickly, that was a very long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. Though. But I see this as a three-step process. Are you reaching the same audience with the same message in the same channel? And, and you can play with all the three levers. So, so I think that's, I love that framework. And I think that's fantastic. And I think, you know, a lot of the brands that we work with and talk to that are, you know, is still operating in that seven figure a year range. Part of the challenge on executing that type of a playbook comes down to how do you structure the team? Yes. How do you create the internal resources or pull together the external resources to actually be able to um, test different channels, right? Be able to sit down and, and, and create this model, this framework you're talking about, being able to actually go out and test channels, being able to optimize channels, and at the same time, be able to consistently come up with new concepts and iterate on creative, right? Because I, I absolutely agree with you that creative is a massive uh, piece of being able to continually go out to new markets or not saturate current markets with the same message again and again. How do you think about, I, I'd like to hear first off how you guys structure your team at Molecule and, and, and if that's changed over the last year and a half or if it's, it's stayed the same. And then we'd love to maybe talk a little about how other brands that are operating at the seven figure mark should be thinking about doing the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's no right way of doing this, but I'll tell you how mm -hmm. we have done this at Molecule. So there's an acquisition team and this is the team that constantly focuses on, on channel acquisition. So they're, they're, they're responsible for managing the channels and ensuring that we keep growing our channels. They're responsible for, they're basically responsible for revenue and, and, and ensuring that our spend level keeps increasing. Then along with the acquisition team, we have an, we have an analytics team. The analytics team is primarily responsible for CAC. And the goal here is to work with the acquisition team to help us identify media spend that is wasteful, to help us identify at what point do we start seeing diminishing returns on a particular channel, let's say Facebook, at what point would you say that we shouldn't go over a certain daily budget? So, so with the current set of audiences, of course, so that's the second team. The third team that I have is, is retention. And, and for the sake of this conversation, right, retention is more around engagement and, and subscription. Molecule has a filter service. So retention is not so much related to acquisition. So these are the three core growth teams that I have. And outside of this, there's also a brand team. This is a creative team that, that does a really great job of churning out creatives as we need them. And the brand team doesn't sit underneath, you know, the growth umbrella or does it? No, it does not. It used okay. to be, but we're going through a restructuring where we have structured the brand team to have their own independent processes. Understood. Okay. That makes sense. And then when you, and for you guys, how, like how big are these, are these teams right now at the stage you guys are at? 
Like how many people? I would say, I would say between four to seven people in each team. Okay. So that's pretty, pretty large. Um, it's pretty large. And on the, it's only in the analytics side that the team is fairly small right now. It's only two people. We're trying to build that team up further. Okay. But that is going to be a very, just in the last quarter, and, and with very low resources, we were able to structure tests where we could eliminate 20% of our wasteful spend. So wasteful spending is also real. I, I was reading a research report and after five impressions, the sixth impression doesn't necessarily help your brand. And, and if you look at any digitally native brand, if they go and if they truly try to answer the question, how many touch points do you need before you sell? And if your touch points are in double digit, Imagine there's so much fat that you could trim and that you should be trimming because that is how you maintain your CAC. So how many touch points? So, and I think this is fascinating because this is something we talk a lot about with, with our clients at Blue Stout. How, given in the, the price point of Molecule to start is right around 800, right? Yes. Um, and I know you guys also have a, a financing or a payment plan option too that, that lowers that to a monthly payment. And then in addition to the actual air purifier device, then you also do, is it monthly or quarterly subscriptions to purifier like filters, right? Yes, we do. We do uh, half yearly subscriptions. Okay. Okay. So just to give everybody some context of, uh, of price point, um, the, what do you find is the, the right touch point number for molecule? And do you think that's consistent across all brands or do you think that changes depending upon price point and um, sort of technical nature of the product? Like meaning does the product require more education to understand? Do you think those touch points should change based upon complexity of the product and price point? And what do you guys find the touch point number to be for Molecule? Well, it's such a, it's such a hard question because to estimate that those number of touch points is extremely difficult. It's very, very difficult to know exactly. And, and primarily because of two reasons that, I, that, I, that we're trying to battle. One is not all touch points are measurable. So, right. so if you're running a billboard ad, if you heard about the product from a friend, those touch points are not measurable. But those touch points can be more powerful than a paid ad. So not, so not all, t- all touch points are equal and not all touch points are measurable. That's number one. And the second one is... In the cross, in the increasingly, uh, increasingly objective cross device world, where people hop through different devices, it's very difficult. If you look at Google Analytics, right, for any store, for example, if you look at Google Analytics, Google Analytics would underreport the number of touch points. Mm-hmm. It'll almost report half the number of where you are at. That's just because Google Analytics does not know how to stitch between cross device user behavior. Do you know what a cross device is or would, uh, do, would you like me to explain that, Alan? Why don't you explain it for the audience? I know what you're talking about, but let's give them yeah, some yeah, context. Yeah. Cross device is when, so Molecule is an $800 device and, and people buy on desktop, but doesn't mean, but they're not introduced to the brand on desktop. So I might be viewing Molecule.com on my phone, but when it comes to making a purchase decision, I'll go to the desktop and buy. Now for Google Analytics, Google Analytics would see me as two different viewers because my device because it will see two different device ids and and that is a problem because the google and analytics would say there are two people coming to the website one did not buy so the mobile traffic is not relevant and the one on the desktop bought so the desktop traffic is relevant so as per google analytics advice you would cut down on mobile advertising now there's a deep flaw if you do that because you've just stopped your funnel or you have killed the funnel at the top. So, which is a big problem in the marketing analytics space. So this cross device behavior makes it extremely difficult to know the exact number of touch points. Right. Now, Alan, there's no right or wrong answer here, but here's how I would approach. And I, to be true, I don't have an answer exactly for where molecule is at. I would say we are, we are in the upper, not in the upper two digits, but we are close to 20. And I'm okay. sure that number is, is grossly wrong. And there's a lot of things we could do to fix it. But here is how we are approaching the problem. So we are saying not all touch points are equal. So some touch points have to be more brand heavy and some touch points have to be more sales heavy. That's number one. And the second, we need to ensure that those touch points get distributed across as many channels as possible. So that way you don't, you don't end up creating fatigue in mm-hmm. one particular channel. And that is a good strategy for you 
to to divide your touch points and then and then start measuring the incrementality of each of these touch points which is no. which is going to be an easier piece so for example if pinterest is one of our touch points you can you can run an ab test where with one cohort you have pinterest and in the other cohort you do not have pinterest and see does the removal of the touch point uh, slow down people's buying habit and if it does not then yeah you're looking then perhaps you don't need that in the touch point quick question dude to get very tactical when you're measuring these cohorts um and the buying behavior and maybe testing them what tools are you using to do so so you could that's that's again a very difficult question to answer right <laughs> sorry i'm asking hard questions no i think i love i love hard questions because it's making me think you have to it, a lot depends on the test design so based on how you have designed the test you could decide how do you want to structure it but the tool stack that we use to run tests like this is 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 uh optimizely mm -hmm. google analytics and we have a uh, we have a cdp deployed that allows us to measure user actions that gives us more clarity but honestly for the the kind of tests that we are talking about so we just ran a test on facebook and what we did was we created cohorts based on geos so we created we we identified hey these group of states and these group of states behave in the same way that is awesome um, my team member came up with this and i was really impressed with how genius of an analysis this was because what he did was he created a geo a geography based cohorts that allowed us to say that these two cohorts behave in the exactly same manner most of the times so that is awesome so now let's take one cohort and and spend money on pinterest and with the other cohort let's not spend any money on pinterest and then we would see what was the what's the blended cac on both of the cohorts and if pinterest really works for us in as one of the touch points then we should see a result and if it does not then then that budget would mean a higher cac and not necessarily more performance hmm. do you know what i'm saying yeah i do no i completely understand you're able to just you're just able to see how much money was spent on both the geos across all the channels and then and then calculate the cac and what we found was the cac wasn't necessarily lower when we introduced this new channel in fact it was higher because that channel did not work and there we go we have made a decision that let's cut down a few display touch points that are not adding any value so and this might be a, another hard question so I'll, I'll i'll brace you for it but the so first off molecule just to give everybody a little bit of context you guys have gone out and raised um you know outside funding venture capital um yes. so you guys have a you know a bit of a, a you know a war chest to to build out these types of teams and the manpower to run these types of calculations and and monitor them and and, and test so the question would be, you know, if you were if you were put in a position to to build out a growth team or to run growth or run marketing at uh, a brand that did not have the same level of resources or capital, and say it was a brand doing, you know, at this stage maybe only two to three, maybe five million a year in revenue, how would you think about structuring that team or structuring your strategy if you could not hire those resources? Would you be comfortable focusing on just a couple channels uh, until you hit a certain next stage, and then you could start to expand upon the growth team or how would you start to think through that scenario and how you would approach it? Yeah. Uh, actually when molecule began, my growth team was just me and one other person. Perfect. So, <laughs> so, so you'll have to be in small. Yep. And the, the beautiful part about growth is uh, if you find success, which is more revenue, you can get more, more resources because now your argument is, Hey, give me one more headcount and I'm going to increase the revenue further. So mm -hmm. in some capacity, the people you hire should pay for themselves. Yep. Now, assuming you're just starting out, I would suggest you need one person who can represent the brand side, so who takes care or who helps the growth team with with content that is needed, and then you need you need one person who can represent the growth side, who who is good at full funnel marketing, who understands the growth the growth acquisition world and they're good at one or two channels themselves ideally mm -hmm. the digital ones such as such as social and search and now with these two people and of course the third one is a web developer you can also decide to outsource it that that's totally fine but you need these two resources 
in your team. And then you need to work with contractors and agencies. I don't like the agency route as much uh, because uh, I, I found that contractors could be more flexible, but there are some good agencies and there's some bad agencies and it all depends on how you manage them. What I wouldn't be fine doing is signing like a year long contract with an agency. No way. What you're really trying to do is working with agencies to establish success. Now there are some areas where agencies are good and you should, you should keep those things with agencies because they have more relationships. So things such as podcasts, radio, TV, even at the current stage where we are at in Molecule, we don't plan to bring them in-house because you need a lot of relationship management, talking to different producers, talking to different hosts, managing the logistics of how things get done. So we, we plan to keep all of that stuff with agencies while we focus on the strategy in-house. So going back to the, to the, to the team, the growth and the creative person needs to sit together and they need to form a strategy of which are the channels they want to try. Now, ideally, digital is going to play a huge part of a media mix and this growth person in-house can run digital themselves. So that is awesome. But for other things such as print, radio, podcast, work with agencies, establish success, calculate at what level of revenue do you think you have, you have enough money going through the system that you need someone to come in and manage and manage those agencies or bring that in-house. And then the same is true for creative person as well. Initially, the creative person can work with contractors. And actually, this is where contractors are much more helpful than agencies. Design agencies can be very expensive mm-hmm. and, and they don't like to work on projects that are small, right. piece, iterative. They like to work on the big, bold brand stuff. Yep. So okay. early on, you don't, I don't think design is, you'll find a design agency that will want to work with you, but you'll find a lot of contractors who are really good at churning content on a fast pace. And you start working with them. Once you find that, yes, Facebook is working, it's, it's going to scale. Awesome. Let's create some staffing internally to ensure that we pay attention as Facebook is scaling and we do it well while we take our creative energies and focus on another channel. So, and is that what you guys did at Molecule in the other days? Did you guys work with contractors yeah. to help produce the content that you guys would have to push out through those channels? So because we were VC funded, as you said, we had, yep. instead of one creative person, we had a copywriter and a visual designer. Gotcha. And we published all the content. Okay. okay. But for the video stuff, yes, we worked with contractors here and there. But it's very close to what you mentioned. And on the on the growth side, it was me I had one person who was looking at search and I had a contractor who was looking at display and social. And, and this is this, and this is the team that actually hit that, that launched us with a seven figure revenue. That's humble. And first off, I'm still amazed by that. I think that's awesome. And I love this, the concept of modeling that success and it's something we can, I want to maybe come back to here in a minute, but I think what's, we've talked a lot about, on the customer acquisition side. And I, something I want to touch on you know, before we run out, of, run out of time today is you know, the other side of that equation is customer lifetime value, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I have to assume that given the, the level of detail that you guys model out on CAC, you have to be incredibly detailed in how you're thinking about the lifetime value of your customer, especially the fact that you guys sell a high AOV product with a retention subscription built into the back end. Um, yeah. Would love to if for for um, I think a lot of people have a hard time calculating for their brands what that customer lifetime value is because I think there's a lot of different opinions thrown out about how to calculate it and how to think about it and how to model it. I'd be very curious to understand how you think about that equation and how to model it. Again, there's no right or wrong answer about it. <laughs> right, and I would say our product is different in the sense a bulk of the lifetime value is is it's an eight hundred dollar product, right? Mm-hmm. And then after that, you have. $129 per year subscription for five years. So it's an $800 product with a potential lifetime, with a potential, uh, and out of which actually the first year is free. So we are looking at 113 to four, so close to $500. So there's an $800 product with a potential revenue from each com- customer of $500 per subscription. So the way in which we look at it, right, is, uh, you can take a very probabilistic approach to it where you can say, what, what do we believe? Filter subscription rates, 
this is the basic uh, LTV analysis where you break down cohorts and you say what's going to be the churn year on year, and based on that, calculate an LTV. So that is that's that is something we do. But when it comes to operationally running growth, right, or, or specifically acquisition, we 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 don't think about ourselves as a SaaS company where we can make a loss on the initial acquisition and then recoup that money via LTV. I I I really think that's a that's a flawed way of looking at growth. Your your ideal philosophy around growth should be that when you acquire a customer in a, in a very short amount of time or in a quick amount of time, you make enough money back that that customer acquisition is profitable and you make enough of a profit that allows you to acquire another customer. So I'm talking about a contribution margin of at least two. And the reason I'm saying that is if you do not make enough money to acquire the new customer from the profits you are left behind with, then your growth is not self-financing. Then for you to grow, you need VC money or you need to risk capital. Because at some point, so for example, if it costs me $100 to acquire a customer and after that customer has been acquired, and after the, the the cost of fulfilling that customer or the cogs have been subtracted, if I'm left with only $30, then that $30 is not enough for me to go raise another customer. Mm-hmm. That means I'll have to find another $70. And that $70 will come from some sort of an external financing. And now your company is not a self-sustaining or a self-growing vehicle. You need external resources to grow. So I'm not saying I'm not saying you can begin at that spot. That's certainly not. That's very difficult because you're a startup. You don't have the economies of scale. But the but the underlying philosophy is you need to get to a place where your contribution margin is equal to your CAC at the least. That means that once you acquire a customer, you make hundred and five dollars in profit. And now what you do is you take that profit, you take hundred dollar from that profit, and spend in acquiring a new customer. And now what you have done is acquisition of one customer helps you go get another customer. And now you don't need external money to finance growth. And this is where you can grow really rapidly. This is where you had the hockey stick or the explosive growth track. So there's no clear outcome. I think in the software industry, they say the CAC to LTV ratio should be one is to three. Mm-hmm. I think all of, all of these philosophies are trying to basically capture the idea that your growth has to be self-sustaining. And at some point you don't need, you shouldn't need external financing to grow your company. And when thinking about that equation, was that sort of something you guys, was an afterthought after product pricing that you used to then determine what, you know, what you could actually go out and invest on the customer acquisition side? Or did you guys literally model this out prior to um, actually pricing out the product? We actually model this out, and honestly, in the hardware device space, there is the there is the advice that if your bomb is if your bill of material is twenty dollars, you should be pricing it at eighty dollars. Mm-hmm. So there is that common wisdom that you should be pricing at four times your bomb, right? Because the distribution cost of getting the product in the hands of the customer is is going to end up creating a certain structure where you will make twenty twenty five percent gross margin. So that's the common wisdom in the hardware world. But when we were creating a philosophy around our own CAC targets, we were very cognizant about the fact that we have to at least be profitable on, on each unit that we sell. So that's an, that's an absolute constraint. We cannot exceed that. We cannot be one of those companies that's losing money as they acquire customers. And then the second piece is we have to ensure that as we acquire customers, we're creating a self-sustaining growth vehicle where we bring in enough money that allows us to go get another customer. So yes, to some extent we modeled this out and our philosophy on this hasn't changed much. 
So this is that was that was perfect. That's exactly what what I wanted to to want to have you break down. That's fantastic. Um, so to cut sort of lead us towards to, to wrapping up and, and letting you go go back to your you know your day job, um, would love to talk about just very briefly any sort of outlooks you have for sort of 2019. Now I know you mentioned that for at least for Molecule, that you guys did not see a huge increase in customer acquisition costs, mainly because of the way that you guys approached uh, how you went to market and thinking about finding new channels. Um, for other brands, you know, that are scaling 2019, what do you see sort of looking forward? Do you, do you see any big changes? Do you think people need to be looking out for, you know, new channels? Or is there anything new on the horizon you're seeing that people should be paying more attention to that maybe they weren't paying attention to in 2018? Yeah, uh, there are a few things, right? Uh, depending on which kind of a scale you're looking at, if there are brands that are just trying to launch, hey, you don't have to be concerned so much about saturation and finding new channels you need to find one or two channels that actually work for you but a bulk of my advice is actually focused on is, is focused on brands that are trying to scale rapidly and and it's it's not an unknown thing right now that facebook use user base is declining but interestingly those users are now moving to instagram and i'm also seeing a rise in linkedin linkedin usage is way more higher than what it used to be two years ago so keep a watch out for how the social landscape is evolving. And, 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 and when people move from Facebook to Instagram, if you had a creative team that could produce square videos, one is to one ratio, then there's a good chance you wouldn't have seen a dip in your performance. So just keep a watch out for how the social landscape is evolving. That's number one. The second thing that I would suggest is, 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 is it's time to get sophisticated about media buying. And what I mean by that is you need to have an analytics layer that allows you to measure some of the things we discussed today in detail. And, and, and that should inform a lot of your thesis on how you're looking at scaling. You can't, if you are operating under the mindset that let's throw money at this and see what sticks and, 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 and it may work, it may not work, then that mindset is not going to take you far and you're going to bleed CAC. So you have to be more informed with your hypothesis. Doesn't mean you have to be a data scientist, but you have to be rigorous and you have to be constantly asking whys. And, 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 and you would see a rise in all sorts of technology that's coming out that's promising personalized marketing. So from, from the advent of CDPs to DMPs to now a lot of tools that promise that, hey, we would do personalized marketing, there, there would be a lot of noise some tools are really good. Some tools are not as much, but keep a lookout for them and try to see how you can integrate them in your system. And then the third thing that I'm really excited about and I'm trying to champion at Molecule is we, uh, all brands, we don't grow because we have money and our acquisition is great. That is just uh, the, the initial push for us to get started. We would only grow if our current customer base would go and talk good things about about you right and, and I think that's the shift that the digitally native brand needs to see because otherwise your growth would always be a linear play you put x dollars and you get a y return mm -hmm. if you want to grow organically you need to ensure that your customers are love you and they're going to do they're going to do uh, they're going to do the championing that is needed for your brand so for an example if you have 10,000 customers and, you as, and they really love you and over the course of next year or this year, if each one of them gets you one customer because they love you so much, then you have already, you have already doubled your growth because you will get 10,000 new customers and your current customers are going to get you 10,000 other customers. So that's the way to think about it. And, that, and, the, and focusing on those current 10,000 customers is equivalent to whatever media spend you would have had to acquire new 10,000 customers. So focus on, on them as a key part of your growth strategy as well, because that is where organic growth really happens. And to, and to be just with the follow-up with one last tactical question as it relates to that, what would you recommend as the best way to sort of facilitate that organic growth and that viral sort of communication and talking about your brand amongst your current customer base? Yeah, uh, at Molecule, we see that as a two-step process. So our growth funnel is a four-step process. 
you acquire people, you convert them, which is primarily acquisition, but then you delight them and you give them tools to share about you. And, and delight is essentially ensuring that the product experience is great. Whichever product they're buying, they love your product. So don't, no shortcuts there. Ensure your product, your product is your crown jewel. That's the best thing you have. And after that, uh, someone would say that you should have a referral engine and you should have a referral scheme in place. But I don't think people refer their friends because you have a referral, give $10 and get $10 kind right. of a thing. People refer things when they truly believe in what in, 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 in the story. And, and that's why once you believe your product is good and people love it, the next thing would be, are you guys planning any campaigns that are related to customers? Are you, are you guys planning any UGC campaign? Are you planning, are, are you baking in features if you have a digital product? Are you baking in features for shareability? The, the short answer is there's no clear tactic, but word of mouth is, is something you can engineer. And, 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 and you can bring growth mentality to engineering word of mouth, which is empowering people with the tools and with, 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 the, with the services they need to be able to share about how much they love your brand. And honestly, it's very difficult to measure as well. It's one of those things that you need to keep doing. And at some point, yes, you will, when you hit enough of a threshold, when you have hundreds of thousands of customers, you would see the scale turn. You would see that the current customer base is going to get you more customers than you can ever get through marketing. That was fantastic. So Graf, this was, this was awesome. I appreciate you being on the show. I think this was incredibly helpful for, for everybody listening. Um, just uh, in case anybody else would, you know, would like to follow up or, or like to follow you online, where's the best place to, to learn more about you or you know, do you publish? Do you, are you on Twitter? Do you write anything? Is there any place that we should send people? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that active partly because work's been like scaling a scaling a fast growing company is keeps me busy, I'm but sure. I'd love to connect on LinkedIn. I, I use LinkedIn quite a lot. Okay. And if you, if I have a new insight, I also do post it on LinkedIn from time to time. So if you want, like, I would be very happy if anyone wants to connect me on LinkedIn and, and yeah, that's a good starting point. Fantastic. And then uh, the best place to find out more about molecule, uh, molecule.com. Please join our waiting list. We have a lot of interesting things coming up in the pipeline. And if you, if you think air is important, like you breathe 24,000 times a day, you should be getting one product for yourself. I love it. That's great. Well, thank you again for being on the show. And uh, this is fantastic. And we'll have to have you back in the future and, and catch up again. But I hope this was helpful. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone for listening. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining us on this episode of The Commerce Lab. To connect with myself or the team here at Blue Stout, visit us at bluestout.com. To join a community of like-minded e-commerce entrepreneurs and other brand owners just like you, join the Commerce Lab official community on Facebook or visit us at thecommercelab.com.